tonight. I want to welcome those who are also watching us on Facebook, our family and friends. Uh, may God bless us with what we all need in this study. Any announcements you'd like to share? Well, let yes, me sir. say, first of all, yes, sir. I appreciate everything that was done on Sunday. Well, wonderful appreciation day. Wonderful meal. Our first meal in a long time. Well, you can't go wrong with fried chicken. Barbecue, <laughs> it was good. But thank y'all so much. The, the monetary uh, love gifts, we thank you so much. Uh, everything went well, I thought. Yes, sir. I'm in the middle. I've got messages from Debbie Bay and Carolina. Oh, let's go. Saturday morning. The women, the woman, and the man, the man. <laughs> Put this on air there. <laughs> okay, I, Saturday morning in, in, in the fellowship hall, and I'm not sure about the time. 11 o'clock. Uh, the Baptist men and the, <clears throat> the women are getting together, and there's a missionary going to be here that's uh, going to uh, speak on the shoebox ministry. And uh, Debbie said, anybody that wants to come, you don't have to sign up. There's plenty of food. She can feed the work. And you need to, if you would, to bring the children. Because probably some of these young people would like to hear it and see what this shoebox ministry is all about. And uh, it's been going on a long time, and, and I'm sure that a lot of people get a lot out of it. So 
what you just asked me. Please come and, and uh, let's have a good turn now. Thank you. Hey, Ben, anyone else? Yes, if anybody has seen a Bible cover walking around somewhere, it's, uh, there's about three of them, the same color and same shape and everything. Somehow or another, I've misplaced mine. Although I did care, uh, take Carolyn Long's home with me. Anyone <laughs> else? Yes, I do. So we have a lot going on in the future here at the church. And I would just ask for any events coming up for the weekend, if you could let me know by Thursday, if you're going to need an announcement done on a Saturday, it would be great because I can pre-program them ahead of time, but I, if I know ahead of time, I can kind of group them if I have enough time so that I'm not calling people one right behind the other. I know it's a nuisance sometimes and I feel bad about it, but it just kind of gets everybody, oh, I need to call and tell her to do this. And, can, we've got an event coming up for the weekend or whenever. Give me a two date notice and that way I can kind of hold it off. If that makes all sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, let me mention that we started our bus ministry tonight. It was the first time. Picked up three riders. Amen. It says a wonderful. And I was the driver. I did pretty good getting them. Yeah, you did. So we had a great. Time getting here, Miss uh, Yvonne, Brother Walter, and Brother Tommy on the road tonight. It's a wonderful time. I'm asking if anyone that has already signed up, I, I left a message on all those that I knew of that were already on the insurance. If you are interested, please meet with me tonight after the service, just briefly to work out a schedule for picking up folks, not only on Wednesday, but on Sunday as well. If there is anybody else interested, interested in picking up people, driving the bus, please stay for this meeting at the church. Uh, it's a very important ministry. There's a lot of folks that can't drive, especially at the dark, even on Sundays. So uh, if you're interested, please stay for this meeting so we can get a schedule worked out. Everybody good? Yeah, I got something. Any other announcements? Yes, yeah. sir. I, got I, don't, I don't need that. This is for the ones here. They need 10 tables set up tonight. Round tables and chairs. Ten tables set up tonight. Round tables and chairs. Anyone else? All right, prayer requests. Uh, let's remember, uh, Brother Steve had his surgery today, gallbladder, and he's back home. Everything's well. Uh, everything went good with the surgery, but remember him and Miss Judy, uh, very special. And then also, Miss Lori Summerlin is still struggling. Please remember her in prayer. Miss Faye Katzenberger, uh, she is in the need of prayer as well. And uh, by the way, Lori and Miss Faye, uh, this is coming through family members, but they could really use some visits from folks just to get, keep them encouraged. And they're, they're facing a lot of illness and troubles. So if you have some time, give them a phone call or go by and visit with them. That's Miss Faye Katzenberger and Miss Lori Summerlin. Then also remember, says she had a great day Sunday, but she fell all to pieces on Monday. Been in the bed ever since. And that's the way it is with her. That's the way it's been for a few years now. She'll have a good day or two, and then she's laid up for a while. And so let's remember her, and hopefully uh, she can get feeling better next day or two. Anyone else you'd like to mention out loud? Yes. If you would remember our daughter-in-law, Jen, she's getting close to having this baby. We've got maybe four or five weeks. She's beginning to swell in her legs and her ankles and having a little bit of issues there. So if you just would lift her up and breathe. If I'm not mistaken, her grandfather passed away as well. Keep in prayer for that whole family. Anyone else? Any other prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Um, Y'all continue to remember the young pastor from uh, North Wilkesboro Grace Baptist Church. Um, he's still in the hospital, still seriously ill. He had a shot put in his um, brain stem or somewhere uh, like two days ago. So it, it was successful, but just pray that it will continue to do what it's supposed to do. And, um, she's the wife.
has decisions to make about where to move him to from the hospital. You know, they get where they want to kick you out after a little bit. So he's been in there for about four weeks. And, um, but they do, she needs a place to, to move him to for some long-term care. So just pray for them. It's just such a sad story, but God is able. Amen. <laughs> Uh, just like to keep my daughter Dana in your prayers. Uh, she called us Saturday night and she's expecting again. And it's, her daughter Adeline is seven years old and Adeline is so excited. She's going to be a big sister. Uh, but Dana has some health issues and she'll be 40 years old in this child's born, uh, next March if everything goes good. So just uh, keep her in your prayers there. She'll be going to some special doctors for high risk and stuff. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Brother Dana, would you lead us in prayer tonight? Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we thank you for this day and the things you've allowed us to do, Lord. And just ask you to bless each and every one that's here and those that are listening as well, Lord. And just be with the pastor as he brings our study tonight, Lord. And uh, just uplift all those that have been uh, brought forth in prayer uh, to ask for prayer tonight. I know we have many here at the church, uh, our church members there that, that have problems and things going on, Lord. And I know there's probably a lot of unspoken as well. But I know that you can take care of each and every need there, Lord. And we just ask you, Lord, to your will to do that. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is one of those rare occasions where we're going to go through a whole chapter tonight. And so uh, we'll try to get you home by 11 or 12. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but we're going over chapter 22. I mean, chapter 2, verses 1 through 22. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 22. Our Heavenly Father, as we go into this scripture, we pray, we pray, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us in everything that would benefit us as a Christian. Lord, help us to learn, to glean, and to use wisdom as we go in our lives. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us in all spiritual truth. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If God were to come to you, and say, ask for anything you want and I will give it to you. Well, how would you respond to that? It might be according to your station in life or according to whatever you're going through. For instance, if you were hungry at the time he asked you, you might say, well, I like some food. If you were thirsty, you might say, well, I want all the water I could drink. I am so thirsty. If you were poor, you might ask for wealth. If you were always being unnoticed, you might ask for fame. If you were one who was always being looked down upon, you might ask for respect. And on and on and on the list could go. Well, in our study in the book of Proverbs, we learned in our very first study that God did indeed ask a person, ask what you will, and I will give it to you. And that person was Solomon. And what Solomon asked for, the Lord was very pleased with. Solomon simply asked for understanding and wisdom. He knew he had to lead a group of people that was precious in God's eyes. And he asked for understanding and wisdom. And so we've already covered chapter one in a couple of different studies. We're going into chapter two tonight, one study for the whole chapter. And Solomon continues to share with his son and with us the value of wisdom. And so he wants his son to be successful in life. I mean, what father or mother doesn't want their child to be successful? But by the same token, God desires that you and I are successful as well in our daily walk. And so let me give you a brief rundown of Proverbs chapter 2. We're just going to do briefly what it's all about. And then we're going to come back and go verse by verse with it. It's sort of like a preacher that asked another preacher, what kind of sermon did he preach? And the, the preacher said, well, I preach three-point sermons. He said, well, give me an example of a three-point sermon. He said, well, first, I tell them what I'm going to tell them. Secondly, I tell them. Then thirdly, I tell them what I've done told them. <laughs> that was his three-point sermon. So here's a brief summary of tonight's scripture. In verses 1 through 4, Solomon is speaking to Rehoboam, his son, and saying, if you will listen, 
and do. And then in verse 5, he brings it all together. Then you'll start yourself on the path of wisdom. Verses 6 through 8, because God wants to make you wise. That's why you need wisdom. And then verse 9, uh, you'll continue to grow in wisdom. Verse 10, because wisdom will change you. Verse 11, the reason it changes you is because you'll make different choices that will begin to protect you in your life. Verses 12 through 15, wisdom will protect you from evil and violent men. Verses 16 through 19, wisdom will protect you from evil and adulterous women. Verses 20 through 22, God will give you endurance to stay on the path. And so let's look in verse 1, Proverbs chapter 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, and so in the first chapter of Proverbs, Solomon begins speaking to his son concerning wisdom and the ways of wisdom. There's two paths. One is the path of folly. One is the path of wisdom. Which one will you take? If you're wise, you'll begin to follow God's set path for our lives. In the second chapter, he continues that teaching, appealing to his son to receive his words and to treasure the commandments. Now, wisdom can never be benefited unless we receive it and treasure it. Let me see. Hey, Roger. Look at that. You just received a pass from Rory Thigpen. He received that. He caught it. But what if he just stood right there? It hit him in the chest. I hope it wouldn't hurt him. Yeah, it did. Hey, there's no shame in it. But he received that, and that's what you and I must do about wisdom. If we really want to be wise and grow, we'll receive the instruction that we are taught. And so it's one thing just to hear somebody speak, and we let it go in one ear and out the other. It's another thing to hear somebody speak that we need that wisdom. It goes in both ears and down to the heart. We apply it to our lives. And so you and I are to make God's wisdom our own. And so we learn God's wisdom from the Bible. Pastors and Sunday school teachers and Wednesday night teachers, uh, they all teach the word of God to help us to grow and help us uh, to feed upon the word. But we must make God's word our own and feed ourselves. And so we do this by Bible study at home or as I used to do when I was working public work, I would take my lunch break and read my Bible. All the other guys, they were playing games and telling jokes and all kinds of stuff, but I was reading the Bible at lunchtime because I wanted to feed upon his word. And so we need to take time and read and study the word of God ourselves. Then look at verse two. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. So he says, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and have my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear into wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. And so to apply, to apply oneself implies effort. We must put some effort behind it if we want to apply it to our hearts and our lives. We are to listen and to apply what we learn to the heart. It won't happen by accident. We must be intentional with learning God's word and allow it to affect our lives in such a way it grows us closer to him. We must intentionally search the scriptures and study them to learn of them. A casual reading is not study. It's just glancing over and then we read and we forget right away. But a study involves meditation. A study involves comparing scripture with scripture. And so a study is different than simply reading. Look at verses three through five. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. The person who diligently cries for, the person who diligently desires for knowledge and understanding must do as a man who mines for silver 
He goes into this cave and he starts taking his chipping hammer. He starts chipping away at the rock until he finds a silver ore. And then he keeps digging and keeps going. He doesn't just find one little bit of silver and put it in his pocket and walk away and go home. No, he keeps digging. He keeps digging. It may take weeks. It may take months. But he keeps on and on until he's mined all there is out of that cave. That's the way it is with you and I with God's word. We're to study and mine it for the treasures which God wants us to have out of his holy and precious word. And so after finding it, the miner keeps on until he has struck it rich. He's got all he can out of that mine. And so one who searches like that will never be disappointed. He goes all the way back to what Solomon said in Proverbs 1, 7, that the principle of this Proverbs is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Here he teaches his son and he is teaching you and I as well that it takes effort to seek out wisdom. Now we're all supposed to have common sense. You notice I said that word supposed to. <laughs> Two words, supposed to. We're all supposed to have some common sense. But God desires to give all of us wisdom. If we desire it and we crave it, God desires to give it. And so Solomon encourages son, do whatever is necessary to get insight and wisdom. Wisdom is discovered and enjoyed only by those who are diligent, by those who are devoted and determined to seek it out. Now, there are some phrases in here we need to pay attention to. This proverb, so far what we've read is a conditional. If you do this, then this will happen. If you do this, then this, that's conditional. If you do this, then this will happen. In verses, uh, let's see what it is. Verses one, three, and four. Look what it says. My son, if thou wilt receive my words. Verses three, if thou criest after knowledge. Verse four, if thou seekest her as silver. Verse five, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. And so if we receive wisdom, if we yearn for wisdom, if we search after wisdom, then God will give it to us. And so the search for wisdom involves listening, obeying, diligence, and passion. One must understand the value of wisdom in order to search for it as hidden treasure. Look in verse six. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Once again, we are told that God is the one who gives wisdom. He speaks wisdom to all who will listen. And out of his mouth is what the scripture says. Another way of saying that is out of his holy word. He gives wisdom if we would only diligently search for it. Look at verse 7 and 8. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. So not only does God desire to give wisdom in his word, he actively works to defend, guard, and preserve all of those who walk in the way of wisdom. The buckler. If you remember back in the medieval times, you'll see... It's very vivid in my mind. You'll see a, a warrior, a sword in one hand and a shield in the other attached to his forearm. That's the buckler. The shield was the buckler attached to the forearm, defending from swords and defending from arrows. One hand to fight with, one hand to defend with. That's what God is saying to us. He will defend us. He will be our buckler who will defend us from the snares of the wicked. And so sometimes we simply need defending. And so God keeps us from harm, keeps us in safety when we exercise wisdom. Look at verse 9. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. 
Yeah, there are so many opinions going on in this world. So many teachings going on in this world. Sometimes we can get thrown off course by the false teachings if we're not careful. That's why we need wisdom. There's so many false teachings going on. So many opinions. People want to pull you into their opinion. And sometimes we need defending against wrong teachings. God's wisdom will help us with that. Now, when we are taught of God and listen to his wisdom, we begin to understand how righteousness works. We begin to understand more about judgment and equity. We also begin to understand about going down the good paths. Now, like me, I'm sure that, especially when we were much younger, there was, wasn't near the amount of paved roads as they are now. And we would drive our vehicles down these dark roads that the rains would come and you'd be going down them and they'd be wet and you'd be making ruts. And so then after it dried out, those ruts were still there. And so if you decide to travel that road again, you better choose you a good rut because you're going to stay there a while. Because uh, sometimes them ruts get all turned and twisted. But if you'll stay in the good ruts, you'll be able to go to the other side without much uh, care in the world. That's what God is saying to us. We need to choose the good ruts or paths to travel in because we may be in those ruts for quite a while. And that is what God is saying. Choose the good paths that will take you to safety. Follow the wise paths. Then look at verse 10 and 11. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. When wisdom enters into our hearts, it gives both pleasure and sure-footedness or safety. The more wisdom one takes in, the more one desires and enjoys it and wants more wisdom. This protection of wisdom makes our decisions better as we gain more wisdom. Our decisions get better with time. And so we need God's protection to gain this wisdom. But wisdom also protects us because understanding this will keep us from making foolish choices and having to deal with harmful consequences because of those choices. Now, we're going to a different, we're going down a different road right here now, verses 12 through 15, talking about evil men. We need to be wary of evil men in our lives. Look at what verses 12 through 15 says. This is wisdom. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths. Now, one of the most important lessons we need to pass on to our children, as well as remember for ourselves is that this world has dangerous men and women in it. We're going to talk about some dangerous women in just a few moments. And this world has dangerous people in it. And we need to warn our children, and we need to stay wary of that as well. Wisdom delivers us, protects our children from dangerous men and wisdom. This is significant, because here's the scary thing about this. We don't always know who the dangerous people are. They look just like us. Many times we associate with them on the job site, in the grocery stores, in the communities, and from the very first moment we meet them, we think, well, that's a pretty good fellow right there. But the more we get to know them, more stuff starts coming out that we weren't aware of at the beginning. And we begin to realize we need to be wary of that person. That's what Solomon is teaching his son and what he's teaching us. Dangerous men are out there and be wary of them. You see, these dangerous people are not always the ones who do us physical harm, but emotional and spiritual harm as well. They harm our souls. They influence us to follow a path that is not wholesome or holy. Wisdom is 
keeps us from going the evil way and associating with the evil person. Uh, mentioned this verse just recently, evil communications corrupt good manners. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. And so the evil people, the Bible says, first of all, speak perverse things. They begin with their mouth, speaking perverse things. And because we are human, because we are fleshly ourselves, we may be attracted to that if we're not saved and born again, or even as a saved and born again person. If we're not walking close to the Lord, that perverse person may have an attraction to us. We don't realize that it's pulling us down with them. Many times we go to people to try to help them see the light, but more often than not, they get us trapped into the dark. And so we need to be careful of these evil men that pull us and have such great influence upon us. Now that word forward is mentioned three times in this one little passage. Three times it's mentioned. Forward means disposed to disobedience and opposition. Difficult to deal with. Contrary. Some synonyms would be headstrong, non-compliant, self-willed. And so this is the person who is forward. The fallen nature of man ever since Adam disobeyed God. Every person born through Adam and Eve has been born with a sinful nature. We're all born that way. I mean, it's not your fault. That was Adam's fault because of what he did. And so we all have a sinful, sinful nature when we're born in this world. And we are naturally inclined to that which is evil and perverse. Listen, I had a guy with me one time. I worked, I was only 20 something. He said, you need to quit teaching your children. Then you let them make their, make their own minds up. I said, son, children need to learn. And if you let them make their own mind up, they're already filled with sin because that is our nature when we're born in this world. You don't teach a child to cheat. That comes naturally. You don't teach a child not to share. I mean, they, they don't want to keep it on their own. You have to teach them to share. You don't teach a child not to say bad words. They can hear enough of that and they start mimicking what they hear. Sometimes it's from other children at school. Hey, I got an eye opener for you. Sometimes it's from what they hear mom and dad say. So we need to be careful because we are all attracted to evil and perverseness, especially when we're young. And notice what the scripture says. Uh, the evil man rejoices and delights in his evilness. Shame is cast away and what is wrong is twisted and celebrated. And it's not unique to our time, but it very much is evident in our time. When we think about all the perverseness that we hear on the news. These evil men sometimes influence us with their speech. They express energetic, enthusiastic, spontaneous shouts of joy, much like you hear at a sports stadium somewhere when they're shouting and ranting and raving. And yet, it's all about perverseness and evilness. Wisdom protects us from the evil man. Wisdom says, you know, there's something about that person there you need to stay away from. You may have to deal with them on the job side or you may have to deal with them in the community, but you don't have to go to every party they offer for you and be right there at every time they invite you to something. Wisdom says, keep your distance from that evil person. They will take you down the wrong path. We as adults need to be careful. In fact, moms and dads, we must be careful who our children hang around. And I've said this already, but it's very true. We need to know who our children are hanging around because our children's friends can pull them from the very values we've tried to instill inside of them and start leading them down a dark path, especially in their young years, not even teenage, pre-teenage, even into the teenage years. But we as adults need to be careful who we hang around as well because you know what? Many times we turn into our friends. I know a lot of folks whose character seemed to change once they started hanging around certain people. I mean, they were positive, they were fun-loving, but because they began to hang around these certain people, they become negative, critical, fault-finding, finger-pointing, sad sex. Change their character totally, all because of who they chose as their friends. Look at verse 16. 
Uh, we're fixing to change into another gear here. Now we're going to talk about the strange woman. Verse 16. <laughs> to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Many times in life we have a tendency to think that only men are immoral when it comes to enticing someone to have an affair with. But Solomon is here warning, beware of the strange woman who flatters with her tongue, who speaks words of entice you. The strange woman is not somebody we think of the way we normally think of strange, like weird, although there are some weird women out there. There's a bunch of weirdos you need to be careful of. Let me say that. This is not what he's speaking of. Though. This, this woman, the one he is speaking of here is a strange woman, is someone who is foreign. Someone who is not like you. This goes along with what the Apostle Paul is saying about having no relationships with those who are unsaved. In other words, when we decide to marry someone, that someone needs to be like us. In other words, it needs to be a Christian like we're a Christian. No Christian should marry an un, a person who is not a Christian. However, and Paul speaks about this. He devotes a whole chapter to relationships in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, however, if you're already married, don't seek a divorce. Just keep praying for them. Maybe you'll win them over through your testimony. He says what he says. Now, in this instance, in Proverbs... <laughs> Solomon is most likely speaking of an harlot, one who tries to turn a man away from his wife. One thing Solomon warns his son about is the use of flattery, how the woman will speak. She speaks smoothly and appeals to the man's ego. Oh, you're so handsome. Oh, what, what big muscles you have. You're so smart. And on and on the flattery goes. But listen now, mothers at the same time are also teaching their daughters about those conniving men out there who try to flatter with their words as well. You're so gorgeous. What a wonderful personality you have. And they use pickup lines. <laughs> I've never used a pickup line in my life, but maybe you have. But they use pickup lines like, did it hurt when you fell? She'll say, what do you mean? You're so beautiful, you must have fell from heaven. <laughs> On and on it goes. And, and so it's not just women that lead men astray. It's men that lead women astray. And so we need to watch out for that. Now I know some guys somewhere thinking, wait a minute now, why should, I, why should I want to be delivered from a beautiful woman who has the perfect shape with smooth lips and a great personality? Well, she's a God-fearing woman. And you're a God-fearing man, and you're single, and she's single, and God has drawn you into that relationship. That's all great. But we're speaking of someone, the strange woman, who tries to get you hooked by her charms to take you away from your wife for herself. And if you still want her, i got words for you. You're an idiot. <laughs> you need to use some wisdom when it comes to this. She will not only bring you down, but you will go the way of folly, and folly will only bring you heartache. <clears throat> Look at verse 17. Which forsaketh the God of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Solomon also warns his son that the woman who gives that kind of attention already has a past record of rebellion against her parents, and most likely infidelity and unfaithfulness with her husband if she's married. I mean, if she has rebelled against her father figure as a child and her mother, then it stands to reason when she gets older, she's going to rebel against her husband and his wishes. And so this not only includes what she does with rebellion against men, but she also rebels against God. That's what the scripture says. Who forsaketh the God of her youth, which speaks of the authority in her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Not only does she forget the authority of those in her youth, she is unfaithful to God. Just the opposite of Joseph, who in Potiphar's wife threw herself at him said, I must not do this thing. It's a sin against your husband, and I will not sin against my God. 
She has no thoughts about God and what she's doing. She just wants to get a hold of you men and ruin your lives. And there's a lot of marriages simply going through the motions because the husband spends all of his free time with the guys. The wife spends all of her free time with the girls. In fact, there's a lot of marriages who have turned into divorce because of this very thing. They don't spend enough time together. Now, I know we all got to work and we all got to do things, but listen, you ought not to spend every waking moment away from your family. You have a family for a reason. Enjoy them and spend time with them. Then on the other hand, there's a red flag that ought to go up when a woman spends more time with other men than she does her, uh, her own husband. Or with, or with a man who spends more time with other uh, women than with his own wife. You see, when something like that happens, there ought to be a red flag inside of us that says, run, get away, flee from this woman. She's a troublemaker. She's trying to break up your marriage. What we ought to say to ourselves when someone starts paying more attention to us than is comfortable, is that's a strange woman right there. That's a strange man right there. Something ain't right. And distance yourself from that individual. And you know what? She ought to be strange. For no one other than your own wife, men, ought to show you the type of attention that you need. And think about it, women. There ought to be no men in your life that shows you any more attention than your own husband. And if they do, they're strange. There's something wrong there. Now listen up. This is very important. The strange woman that ends up tearing up many homes and destroying lives, for most of us, is not going to be a harlot down the street. It's going to be a woman found in the church with her Bible open and listening to the preaching and saying amen once in a while. But her heart is not right with God. Why do you think so many preachers and deacons and choir members and people of the church have adulterous affairs? It's with other people in the church whose hearts are not right to begin with. And they seek to have a relationship with you. This is for our family's own safety as well. How many homes have been destroyed because of what started with flattery? Simple flattery. Someone comes up and they already feel that distance between them and their husband or them and their wife. And because they're craving attention and they don't get it at home, they seek attention where somebody will give it to them. And so a person is approached by a strange woman or a strange man who gives them the attention they're craving. One thing leads to another and then boom, an adulterous affair has taken place. It exploded in their face and ruined their marriages and their family before they even knew what was going on. Now I'm not saying you can't compliment somebody. I mean, when somebody does a great job at a church, man, you, you do a great job job well done or, or maybe uh, you can say <laughs> I better be careful here <laughs> you say that's a beautiful dress you got on I like the way your hair is done but you got to be careful because men you don't need to go to somebody that's not your wife and say man you're drop dead gorgeous -hoo -hoo. <laughs> no you don't do that that's for her husband to do not for you to do that to another woman am I right or wrong Hey, I mean, tell me, am I right or wrong? <laughs> now, now, take me, for instance. I'm just going to use me as an example. <laughs> My wife tells me, Roy, you're a hunk of burning love. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. But listen, you don't have a right to say that. Only my wife can tell me that. Right. Amen, Susie? I know she's watching. <laughs> So we need to be cautious on how we compliment people. Be cautious in how we compliment. Don't let the other person think, they're trying to come on to me. No, no. If it's an innocent compliment, that's great. But you be careful. 
Because there is women and there is men that's craving attention. And when you show them a little attention, man, they'll jump on that. So be cautious. Verse 18. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. This is an important part of wisdom's protection. To see where a path leads. Time with the flattery seductress may seem wonderful, but wisdom helps us understand where it's going to lead, and that is down to death. Look at verse 19. None that go unto her return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life. To be enticed by the seductress and partake in an affair with her is to die spiritually and emotionally. There is so much guilt associated with infidelity. It takes a toll on the person. Many men and women have found their lives and their families destroyed and consumed by a relationship with an adulterous man or woman. Churches have stories they could tell. Man, I've been to churches as a pastor, and they told me the pastor before me got caught up with a woman, and he had to leave. I said, wow, that's terrible. It happens. It happens. We know, probably every one of us knows someone who's gotten caught up in an affair and had to leave the church or it ruined their testimony. What we need to do is stay away. Red flags need to go up. Look in verses 20 through 22. We're going to close it out. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. I've always found it very beneficial to hang around men <coughs> who are good men. Men older than myself that I could glean from. Even as a young man, I love to hang around the preachers and the deacons and Sunday school teachers so I can glean from their experiences and learn from them. And when you learn from their experiences, it gains us wisdom. You know, a lot of people have to learn things the hard way. I've never been one to have to do that. If I can learn something from David that would keep me from making a foolish mistake, I want you to tell me and teach me. <laughs> I don't want to have to learn the hard way. I want somebody to teach me some wisdom so I don't have to go that way. And so I'll try to learn from others. Not only the great things that will help make me better, but the things that they have done that I can avoid, that they don't mind sharing. And so one of the best things that a young teenager can do is spend time with some of the older folks just to learn from them. And then young men, learn from the older men and women as well. Young women need to learn from the older women. Titus teaches us about how the young women ought to learn from the elder, the young men ought to learn from the elder. And so that's a great point for us to consider. Solomon reminded his son of the consequences of the path of the seductress. It invites the discipline and judgment of God. <coughs> Notice what it says in verse 21. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect <coughs> shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. The consequences are clear and we have a choice. It's the way of folly or the way of wisdom. There's a high price to pay if we would gain spiritual wisdom, and that is a diligent effort to put effort into it, to learn of God's word and apply it to our hearts and lives. But then there's a greater price to pay if we don't, and that is death, emotional, <coughs> spiritual, and even possibly <laughs> physical. Any comments? Anything you'd like to bring up? <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us and ask your blessings now as we go home, meditate upon what we've read and studied. May you be glorified and honored. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Anyone?
considering being a bus driver, please meet me right here. Won't take but one minute.